Leonie had sequestered herself away in the library and was actively reading a book that Jason made for her. She had to cast a linguistic spell to read it, and some of the content was lost in the magic. A few words, but not a lot. He had been doing these since they came back from Osmer, and while at first she was skeptical of the content, every book he gave was an instruction manual of some kind. Each covered a specific topic, from politics and economy to warfare and sociology, and each one was a bit of a slog to read through. But she noticed the merit of study, and he even agreed that when she finished one, he would make a book from a series she wanted. So here she was, reading up on the political reasons and the ramifications of something called colonization. And for all the higher planes, it was boring beyond reason. Yet the idea of reading more of a series called The Freedom, it had both a story and art in it. It told the story of a wonderful friendship over something as mundane as swimming, but she still enjoyed reading it. She had a good feeling that Jason was likely going about teaching the recruits about some battle that happened in his world and how it was thought then would likely ask them how they would approach the same battle but in hers, with full or limited access to magic or resources of this nation. A common theme he set up was telling them that they can't find the enemy, an effort to get them to think about scouting, too. An effort that has paid off, for the most part, as he keeps saying, information is power. Not that she ever disagreed, but the way he explains it makes it seem like he had more access to that information in his world. As she sat there reading, her eyes landed on something she was not ready for, as the gifted sword Jason had given her started to glow. Its blade slowly shifted to a pale blue and was held there. She thanked Jason under her breath for his suggestion to keep the blade a bit out of the sheath, and her free hand reached down to the sidearm he had given her, a battle wand he once used as his, but now hid under her dress, luckily for her easy to get to. The Sigkauer Ma-17 fit in her hand easily enough, and she ran through Jason's instructions on how to use it. She then scanned the room and spotted an Orkian woman coming in through a window. Leoni pulled the weapon free and leveled it on her, summoning some strengthening magic to allow her to use the weapon with one hand. I recommend you speak quickly, Leoni said in a stern voice. The Orkian woman didn't seem surprised, but maybe upset. As she stepped forward, she held her arms out to her sides. Twelfth Princess Liani, I have come to deliver a warning, one my tribe's shamanist demanded you be aware of, she said slowly as she bowed a bit. The summoned being you have brought, he must have a child. Fifty years after his passing, the world will require his blood again. If not, then the world will fall to the Empire of Night, and all will know nothing but carnage. Liani thought about that answer. Jason will die, and if he has a child, it may or may not have a long lifespan, depending on his partner. Moreover, the Empire of Night is mostly isolated beyond the borders of the Kialmas Mountains, and rarely ever leave their little paradise. The real issue is that they are extremely territorial and exceedingly bigoted. But they have only ever sent raids to other nations, and they are far beyond her nation's borders, effectively a distant issue one that would take them months to reach, and vice versa. You understand that that is a lot to take in. The Empire of Night has only ever sent envoys to my lands, Liani said back. My shamanist says to watch how they react next time to Jason and all will be clear. The Orkian said then took a few steps back and leaped back out the window, taking a sprint into the trees at the edge of the estate. Liani considered her words, and in her adventuring days, she managed to get in for a week to do a job. But for them to be a problem was odd. They had adopted a strict neutrality policy with the rest of the world and never engaged in anything, not even trade. She remembered their land, the magic that they had kept the lands in a state of near constant shadows. Even at the peak of summer, the clouds didn't break. She shook her head and put the battle wand back in its snug holster after activating the safety. This was not something she needed to worry about now and turned back to the book. Flipping a page, she found an image of a pair of humans. One was a male, she could tell that much, and the other was likely a female. A bit curious about it, she looked more carefully at the woman. While the image was black and white, she could make out the features well enough, along with her body's dimensions. She slowly stood, equipped her sword to her belt, and walked out to her room with the book. Finding the large mirror, she looked between herself and the woman in the image. The first difference she knew of was her skin. She was a light shade of blue, 
with a thin layer of plates just under the surface. Lini felt a bit off by that. The woman in the image looked like she had smooth and soft skin, but Lini's was hard in the areas just above the plates, and natural recess formed in the gaps. Looking back at the image, she noticed the woman's eyes. While she wasn't sure about the color, their shape threw her off. They were a bit bigger than Leani's, as her eyes were smaller and took up the same amount of space on either side of her nose. Leani looked up to the mirror and took a closer look at her eyes. The two sets rested one over the other and had mana running along the edges of her eyelids. The golden yellow of the royal family is clear and vibrant with her life still ahead of her. She glanced up at her brows. She didn't have a thin layer of hair like Jason. She had a row of plates that glowed softly, containing a bit of her mana. She looked farther up at her hair, frowned a bit, and undid her braid, letting her hair free, allowing it to move with her emotions. It was shaking slightly, the thick strands that shifted and pulsed with the beating of her hearts. Nothing like the woman in the book. She pulled back as her hair dropped. Was this why he kept his distance? Does he want the company of a human woman? She uncomfortably braided her hair. Royals can't give away emotions easily. But her hearts felt heavy. She thought about Jason. At first, she considered him a monster, and the way he dispatched his enemies was honorless and efficient. A cold and calculated way of war that even the Caintics would be afraid of. Yet now, after almost a month of watching him, she knows more than ever he is a man. He is kind and compassionate when he needs to be stern and demanding when required, and cold and wrathful when he has no other choice. And somehow when she sees him, her heart's lost their pace, and her breath grows short. Her eyes can't stop staring at him, wishing he would look her way. She shakes her head. These thoughts are wrong. He is a summoned champion, and now a knight of her household. Her household of just two. Just she, an eligible princess of a grand nation, and he, her sworn knight and guardian. She sighs and picks up the book, looking over the woman. Lini glanced at the mirror, considering her figure. She was not considered curvy, but she did possess an above-average bust. Her legs were toned from long walks as an adventurer, which held up her supple rear. She was fit and healthy, and her body showed it. Looking back to the book, the woman would be considered less fit than she, but she couldn't help but think about those differences. If all women in his world looked like her, or she was the peak, then Leoni would be a divine entity, unless the woman was at the bottom of the line, in which case she wouldn't even register in his mind. She gripped the book hard, her mind thinking of other races in this realm, in this world, some of whom even Leoni couldn't compare to. The thought of her losing him to the seduction of someone else was hard on her, and in a fit of anger, she threw the book hard, shattering the mirror. She stared at the broken pieces, her mind demanding more, to break something else, to hurt someone else. But her door was forced open as Jason ran in, sidearm in hand, and looked around. Princess, I heard the mirror break. Are you okay? He asked her, his face showing worry but readiness to act and fight for her. Leany stared a bit shocked by the speed he had arrived, the distance he had to cover to get to her, and spoke weakly in a shaking voice. I am all right. Jason relaxed a bit and took a closer look around the room and spotted the book. Walking over, he picked it up, and to her dismay, it opened to the page she was on. She withdrew, not wanting him to look at her, ashamed at her outburst and lacking faith in her appearance. Jason glanced at her once, then closed the book and placed it on the table. He said nothing but walked closer, pulling her into a hug, a deep and reassuring one. Leany gasped as he did so, as for the first time in three weeks he had embraced her like this, the warmth of his body surrounding her, the gentle and steady beat of his heats. This is what she wanted, and he gave her without a word. You don't need to worry about how you look, she heard him say beside her as he pulled up and hand and cradled her head to his shoulder. I know that it's hard, but I also know that you aren't human, and I don't care. I will like and serve you, and you alone. She could tell he was honest, his voice calm and careful, the steadiness of his hearts and the measure of his breath. I am sorry. I know I shouldn't compare myself, but I have missed this, this closeness, as unconventional as it is, she said slowly, her voice frail at the admission. It is wrong of us to be so. I am your summoner, you are my summons. 
She tried to push away, but he didn't release her. You are wrong. His voice was hurt, and his body flexed to keep her there, to keep her in his arms. You are my savior. You gave me a second chance at life, and I am happy to give you that life. His hold loosened, and he pulled back so she could see his expression. It was warm and kind, a soft and apologetic smile on his lips. I am sorry for keeping you at arm's length. I didn't want the recruits to think I was favoring you, as I feared they would bother you to curry favor. So you aren't avoiding me because you dislike me? She asked with faltering words. He shook his head, his expression shifting to a reassuring smile, a look of care and compassion. No, I did want you to be bothered by them, but if you ask, I will make my care of you public to them. He said with a tender voice, his soft tone hold the word in the air between them. Lini felt a wave of relief wash over her. He wasn't hiding from her. He cared about her well-being and gave her space to work as she wished. But she shook her head. It would be wrong to let others see this. Their closeness. She was a princess, and he was her summons. No, just please don't hold back when we are alone. She looked back up at him. His expression was overjoyed, and he leaned in, closing the space between their lips. Yet he held shy, the gap but centimeters apart, and spoke a request. Can I kiss you? Liani didn't want him to have this, so she kissed him. She would initiate, and it felt right yet forbidden.